Tonight we are looking at the centerpiece of the book of Revelation, this mountain top right there in the middle. And I believe this is what is going to give the full picture of uh, what we have seen up to this point. Let's pray and let's dive into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this new opportunity we have to study together, to deepen our knowledge in your word and see more clarity with regard to what has been happening, what is happening and what will be happening in our history. May your spirit guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. We have seen up to this moment three of the sections of the book of Revelation. You see the structure there. One and seven, two and six, three and five. And this is the middle section, right? And do you remember what the first section was? The seven churches? Yes. I have a different outline here or layout. The seven churches. I use segments instead of bullet points so that it will be more visual for a period of time rather than just point in time. So we have seven segments of the history of Christianity under the seven churches. The seven churches is the basic layout of history from the death, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ all the way to the end. Now, the seven seals, the second layout, focuses on God's people. If you want, on God's Israel. Israel means the one that fights or battles for God, or the one that wins with God. And when I say Israel, I'm not speaking about an ethnic Israel. I'm speaking about Israel as it appears in chapter 7, those that will be victorious and uh, they appear in front of the throne in heaven. So that's the second outline, the seven seals. And then we have the seven trumpets, where the focus is not Israel, God's people, it's the enemy of God's people. So this is history in general. This is the history of God's people from victory, from the victory of Christ to the final victory. And this is the history of the enemies of God's people. I also want to emphasize a segment we saw last time. You remember there is this 42 months or 1,260 days or time, times and half of time or 3.5 years. So those are three ways of uh, designating the same historical period. I put it there because it will help us to identify some elements in tonight's segment. Now, going back here, you see right at the top here, there is this yellowish triangle and with a green triangle on the top. And there's a meaning for that. What is interesting in this segment is that history is being told in this chiastic structure in a certain way that points to the highest point in the history of God's people. And that is happening right on top here. And uh, I have a layout of this section here in this bigger triangle. 
where I show what is happening practically in chapters 12, 13, and 14. Chapter 12 is the beginning of the conflict. Chapter 14, the final part, is the end of the conflict, the conflict between good and evil. Then you have Satan's strategy on one side, you have God's strategy on the other side, and you have something amazing going on right here. And this is, as I said, the culmination of the story of the book of Revelation. So we are going to start here, down here, going up. We are going to reach this part here and then going back down. Okay? That's the structure. Let the story start then. The introductory vision, because you know there is always an introductory vision. Each segment out of the seven has an introductory vision. Do you remember what is specific of the introductory visions? There's something specific. What? It always starts where? In the sanctuary. Do you remember where the seven churches started? Where? Among the candlesticks, that is, in the... Correct. Do you remember where the seal started? It started in front of the throne, and the good question is, where is the throne? It's in the most holy place. And the reason why is because here is the enthronement of Jesus Christ or the moment when Jesus Christ's victory on earth is ratified and he sits on the throne. So that's why the throne room is in view. Where did this part start? The seven trumpets. Well, it was in between the courtyard, because one altar was in the courtyard, and the other one was in the first section, which is the holy. Okay? We also saw that some of the biblical festivals are in view. What was the festival that was in view here at the seven churches? Passover or Pesach, right? Then we had uh, Pentecost, in the seven seals, what is the festival in view in the seven trumpets? Is the trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. But also the Tamid, the daily service, because the trumpets were used in the daily service throughout the year as well. If this is the order, Passover, Pentecost, trumpets, what's next? in the order of the biblical festivals. So you have Passover, Pentecost, trumpets, uh, tents is later. There is one in between tents and trumpets. Which one is that? Which one? I don't know. What is the festival? Ah, that's it. That's it, Yom Kippur. So, see how the order is respected? It's exactly the biblical order of festivals throughout the year. Okay, so it's Yom Kippur. So, here you have Passover, Pentecost, Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and what you mentioned, the Sukkot, the boots, or the final festival, and it appears later on in the book of Revelation. So we would expect this to happen. Let's see if it does happen indeed. Revelation 11, verse 19. Then the temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Where was the ark of the covenant? Most holy place. What was the festival that had to do with the most holy place. Yom Kippur, 
the Day of Atonement. It was the only festival that focused on the section of the sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant was in the temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, and earthquake, and great hail. Now, this is something very interesting because, again, the structure, the, the overall structure is this, right? And we have Passover, Pentecost, trumpets, and it's right here where Yom Kippur is. And then we are going downwards, and Sukkot, or the boots, will be all the way down here. I believe there is a significance to the fact that Yom Kippur appears right at the summit, right at the centerpiece of the book of Revelation. So, to the story. After he sees the temple being open and uh, the Ark of the Covenant is shown, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed in, with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. This is a pretty shiny woman, isn't it? Man, do you know when a woman is the shiniest? Okay, do you think this woman is pregnant? Okay, let's read on. Then, being with child... Obviously, she is. She cried out in labor, so she's in labor already, and in pain, the Greek says tormented, to give birth. Now, when somebody is in that situation, that is difficult enough, isn't it? But it doesn't stop there. To make it worse... And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. Okay, so you have a woman in labor and a dragon. What does the dragon want? His tail drew or dragged I like dragged because dragon and dragged <laughs> go together. His tail dragged a third of the stars of heaven. See, this is the one third that belongs to the devil. And threw them to the earth. So this is the first mentioning of the fact that one third of the stars, I don't have time to explain, but stars in the Bible signify angels in some context, they are thrown to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to, to what? To devour her child as soon as it was born. So this is something cruel going on there. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And this is a quote from the book of Psalms chapter 2, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Who's the child? Obviously, the language reveals the child is Jesus. Who's the woman? The church. Well, I think a better word or expression here is God's people. Because the church is more a New Testament concept. But it's God's people. So the Messiah comes from God's people. Now, if somebody wants to see Mary here, the mother of Jesus Christ, I don't want to exclude that. The problem is, when we read on, there will be some stuff there that will not match the picture for Mary. So it has to be something much wider than just Mary. Okay? But the child is born and caught up to God and his throne. 
And then it says, and war, polemos, that's the Greek word, or argument, dispute, controversy, that's where our concept of the great controversy is taken from. Right? And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought, or polemized, that's the word in Greek, polemos, fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, or they were not strong enough, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So this is a moment after which they have no place in heaven. This happens at the cross, because after the cross, it seems that they have no access back to heaven. Satan and his angels. Before the cross, there is some sort of entrance that you can see, for instance, in the book of Job, where the dragon, the devil, Satan, masquerades as representative of planet Earth. After the cross, that changes. So this is now the second moment in the book of Revelation chapter 12 when they are cast down. First, in chapter 12 verse 2, when the dragon drags them, they are thrown down, but it seems that their access is not totally barred when it comes to heaven. After the cross, and there are Bible verses for that, the situation changes, and they have no access back to heaven. So the gr great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, and we have the identification of the devil here, right? Called the devil and uh, Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So this is a uh, final cast out. I'm jumping a few verses. Verse 13 says, Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Okay, so what is the picture? The woman is giving birth. The dragon wants the baby. He can't have the baby. The baby goes back to the father. And then you see that segment of the war, the big controversy between Michael, which is Jesus Christ, and the dragon. And as a result of that battle, they are cast out. Now that they are cast out, or cast down, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted whom? He can't do anything wrong to the baby, or to the child, to Jesus Christ, he goes after the woman. Who's the woman? So here now we can see it's not Mary, because there are things happening to the woman that are much bigger than Mary, right? He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. A better translation is to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. So the dragon wants to get the woman now. She receives wings. She flies into the wilderness. And that's a very interesting imagery because you know the woman was in the wilderness in the Old Testament, right? And God took care of the woman in the wilderness. At one point, God even says, I brought you to me in the wilderness. So the wilderness is a place prepared for the woman where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Now you can see why I put this period of time here. Because that Time, times, and half of time is 
this segment here. We've seen it last time as well, okay? So practically at this time, we are already here with the progression of history. Then the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. This is another very interesting imagery. When the flood goes after the woman. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Is she carried away by the flood? No, because she is where? In the wilderness. And what kind of place is that? That is the place prepared by God for her. And what happens? The earth had the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So even if you don't explain the symbols, the story is captivating, right? The dragon is going after the woman. He can get her because God intervenes and the flood is swallowed up. Then something bad happens. And the dragon was enraged with the woman. This is a critical moment. Because up to this point, the dragon still hopes he can harm the woman. There is a moment somewhere here. I don't know exactly where. But I know somewhere here, after all this time, you know, because it started even before the cross. If this is the cross, this whole story started before the cross. And it came, it came, it came, it came. And we are now here. The dragon wasn't able, hasn't been able to destroy the woman. But now something specific is highlighted about the dragon. What is highlighted? The dragon is enraged. <sighs> and he went to make war with whom? You would expect with the woman. Problem is, something happened to the woman in the wilderness. Because the dragon is not going after the woman here. The dragon is going only after the rest or the remnant. That's the word remnant there. After the remnant of her offspring. What happened to the woman? Where is the woman? Why is the woman taken out from this picture? Ah, something happened in the wilderness to the woman. Because interestingly, in the Bible... The woman, faithful or unfaithful, is a symbol of God's people. Faithful woman is God's faithful people. Unfaithful people, or harlot in biblical language, is God's unfaithful people. Or those that were God's people at one point, but then they abandoned God. And indeed, later on, you will see next time, the woman that we left in the wilderness, she had all the conditions of life ensured by God himself, and yet something happens to her. Because later on, when we pick her up again, the woman is not the bride of the lamb. She is the lover of the dragon. Only a remnant is now in view. The dragon is uh, still enraged with the woman. Although the woman now is riding the beast. The beast being an ally of the dragon. But even with this love affair of the woman with the beast... The dragon is still enraged with the woman, and that's why he goes after the rest or the remnant of her offspring. Who are they? And this is the famous verse that I'm sure you know. 
those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. These are only a remnant of the woman. The woman, by and large, is riding the beast. So, now we are moving up. We started here, the beginning of the conflict, and now we see Satan's strategy. So the dragon is enraged against the woman and wants to go against the remnant of the woman. What does he do? Then I stood on the sand of the sea, some of the translations say. I believe the best translation is, then he, that is the dragon, the enraged dragon, stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. So the picture is this. The dragon is enraged, and he wants to bring together his final strategy to destroy the remnant of the woman. And he's looking for an ally. He stands on the sand of the sea as if waiting for somebody to appear from the sea. And who appears from the sea? The beast. Now the beast, which I saw, was like a leopard, bear, lion. You know, these also appear in the book of Daniel. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Do you know about anybody else in the Bible giving uh, power, throne, and authority to somebody else? God the Father giving it to Jesus Christ. So obviously this beast here masquerades Jesus Christ. So the dragon is Satan himself. The beast is somebody, an entity that masquerades Jesus Christ. So you have the Father, the Son, and you have one more in the Bible, Holy Spirit. Here you have the dragon, the beast from the sea. Do you have somebody else too? Yes, there is a beast from the earth later on. We'll see that. Which is called in uh, the following chapters the false prophet. So see how the true or divine trinity is mirrored or masqueraded or falsified, forged by a false trinity, a demonic trinity. Okay, and I saw one of his heads as it as if it had been mortally wounded. The right translation is slain unto death. As if slain unto death. Who was slain unto death? Jesus Christ was slain. This is only as if slain. Right? It's not slain unto death. It only looks as if slain unto death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Okay. So this beast is being worshipped. But through the beast they worship the dragon. We worship Jesus Christ, but through Jesus Christ we worship God the Father. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then there is a description of what this beast has been doing in history. And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Now this is a very interesting strategy in the book of Revelation, when a new entity appears, there is a brief description of uh, that entity, and then there's a throwback. So, practically what we have here 
we are somewhere here in history. But this description of the beast, the 42 months, refers to this time here. So that means that during the time when the dragon was going after the woman, the dragon was going after the woman through whom? Through that beast. Because the beast was active during this time here. Or let me paint it here. Okay? So the dragon was working through this beast, chasing the woman, trying to destroy the women. Okay? Then it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, and now it switches to future. So we were here, there was a description of the past activity of the beast, but now there's a description of the future of the beast. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose name has not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So all those that are not written in the book of life will be worshiping the beast. Question is, how will this all happen? And then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. You remember what helped the woman? The earth. The earth swallowed the flood. Now, interestingly, from the very earth that swallowed the flood and helped out the women, another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. In the book of Revelation, the lamb is always Jesus Christ, and he appears 30 sometimes. Except this moment here, when this second beast later called the false prophet, has horns like the lamb. Horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Very weird combination. Some sort of fake again. Some sort of deceitful working is in view. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Do you remember who exercises the authority of Jesus on earth at this time? Biblically, the Holy Spirit. See the same relationship here? So the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to what? Worship the first beast. So what happened actually? During these 42 months, the beast was attacking trying to destroy the woman. But at one point, something happened, something that looked like a deadly wound. So the first beast is out of picture for a while. The first beast is dead here. Well, looks like that. If it had been dead, it would have been final. It just looks like. But then a second beast appears, and that beast works with the authority of the first beast and convinces the people of the world, the inhabitants of the earth, to worship the first beast. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. This is uh, pretty striking, isn't it? Because there are manifestations that are supernatural and they have one purpose. 
to the seed. Throughout his story, up to this point, the strategy was force. The use of sheer brutal force. From this point on, it shifts, and instead of force, it is deceitful things to mislead, to mess up, to fool people. And he, oh, here the, here's the word, he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make what? An image or a copy or a replica to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Okay, let me come back here again. There was a time in the history of Christianity, the 42 months or 1,260 days or time, times, and half a time or 3.5 years when the message of the gospel was uh, preached in very difficult circumstances. You may remember the witnesses from last time. The witnesses were witnessing in what? Sackcloth. Difficult times. Why? Because of the persecution happening. Who was persecuting them? Who was persecuting the woman? The dragon. Through whom? Through the beast. But obviously at one point there is a wound that the beast, the first beast receives. Out of picture for a while. But then the second beast appears. And the role of the second beast is to bring this beast back. How? Creating, convincing the inhabitants of the world to create a replica, a picture of this beast. Meaning, to bring back a kind of situation that used to happen here during these days. What was happening here? Fierce persecution. Where the gospel was preached in very, very difficult circumstances. So, are we getting the picture? It is a throwback and this same kind of situation is brought here. So there will be a segment here that will resemble this segment over here. How do I know? The text says it. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. This is like God giving breath to Adam right at the beginning. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Oh, so the same kind of killing machinery that acted here in history will be repeated over here. What else? He causes... Now, it's not saying how here, but we know from the previous text how. Through force? No, it's deceitful working. Right? Deception, that's what it's called. Deception. So, the main thing is deception in the picture, as opposed to force or enforcing things. But... Those that cannot be deceived, they will be forced. Because it says as many as would not worship the image of the beast would be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And there are some difficulties with the text here. We know the number is 666. Well, actually, 
666, and there are all kinds of uh, explanations as to what that may mean. There are some translations that say the mark, which is the name of the beast, or the number of its name. So it's either the name or the number of its name, which is 666. Now, I'm not going to stop here to dive into the meaning of the 666, because remember, we are following the story. We are now here somewhere, very close to the end, but there are still things that have to happen. What has to happen? See, we saw the beginning of the conflict, Satan's strategy in the final segment of the war or the controversy, and now we are up here. Remember what the question was, who is like the beast, who is able or who has power to make war with him? What's the answer to that? Who is able to make war with the beast? Uh-huh, correct. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. We saw this verse previously, 13 verse 8. Worship him, the beast, whose name have not been written in the book of life of the lamb. So you have Jesus, the lamb, fighting the beast. And you have those that are written in the book of life of the lamb. Correct? Now look what is in this next section right at the peak. And I looked and behold, what? A lamb standing on Mount Zion. Alone? No. With whom? With the 144,000 having his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. See? In opposition to those that have the mark of the beast on hand or forehead, these have his father's name written on their foreheads. Some uh, versions also have his name, that is the lamb's name and his father's name on their foreheads. Okay, so somebody is able to overcome the beast. The lamb is stronger than the beast. Not only for himself, but also for those whose names are written in the book of the Lamb. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. This is a big celebration happening on Mount Zion. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So they have that big celebration, and these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes, these were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Somebody may ask, okay, so all these are men because they didn't defile themselves with women. And they are virgins, male virgins, that is. What is this imagery? Well, remember from chapter 7, the 144,000, were lining up for the final battle. So it's an army situation. And this imagery, this picture of uh, the soldiers not defiling themselves with women, staying virgins, is a biblical picture for a situation when the men go to army, and you may know or not, one of the most difficult problems for those that do military service, especially if they are married, is how they are going to be faithful to the one they are married to. The point here is, 
that these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. It is a picture of total faithfulness to the Lamb. And then, in their mouth was no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne, right? So that's the character of the 144,000. So we've seen this big celebration up here, right? We've gone all the way up. We saw the celebration, the lamb and the 144,000, the overcomers of the beast. And then the next chapter, the next section is what? God's strategy. What is God's strategy? What is in chapter 14, starting with verse 6? Three angels' message. Again, there is a very interesting parallelism. Three angels here. Dragon, beast 1, and beast 2 over here. So you have a trio here. And then you have a threefold message over here. Right? But look at something very interesting. You may have heard that the most important message that we are to preach these days is the three angels' message. Have you heard that? I'm sure. Now, is that true or false? What is right here? Ah. So what is the most important message? And what is the three angels' message about? Let's look. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the what? Everlast what is the everlasting gospel? Isn't the everlasting gospel exactly what happens here? The good news of salvation through the Lamb, the celebration on Mount Zion, right? So, in other words, we go all the way up to the mountaintop, and we, when we witness the celebration of victory of the Lamb and of the 144,000 who are those that are faithful to the Lamb, the next picture we see is the three, angel, three angels flying out. And it's like one, two, three that carry exactly this message. The message of victory through Jesus Christ. The message of the Lamb. That's why it is correct to say that the three angels' message is the most important message because the three angels actually carry this message. Of victory in three different aspects. What are those aspects? That I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give Him glory, or give to, glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him, who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of waters. Then the second angel comes. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And this Babylon is actually the harlot, the woman we saw in the wilderness. She was still faithful there, but Something changes down the road. Then a third angel followed. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength or unmixed. You remember I spoke about justice being mixed with mercy in the previous section, the seven trumpets, because the seven trumpets are God's justice manifested against the enemies of God's people, those who persecute God's people. 
But all these things here, all the manifestations of God's justice, are mixed with mercy. But there is a moment where there is no mercy mixed in it. It's full strength or unmixed into the cup of his indignation. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And then we have this section here, which points out the end of the conflict. See, beginning of conflict, end of conflict. And what do we have here as the final segment? Then I looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. What is he going to do? And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And this is the harvest of the grains. But there is also another harvest. What harvest? Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. See, so there's two harvests. The first harvest is the harvest of the grains. The second harvest, another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So question, which harvest is which? Because one is the harvest of the faithful, the other one is the harvest of the evil, of the wicked. Which one is which? The grains, obviously, is the harvest of the faithful, right? And the vine, because of the wine press, this is clearly a picture of judgment, a judgment of uh, the wrath, full strength being poured out. It's the seven, what, plagues, because you had the seven trumpets, But here in the final section, you will have the seven plagues, okay? So, obviously, this picture here of the wine press is uh, the harvest of the wicked. With this, we practically have taken a look at all this section. I believe it's remarkable, it's amazing that right here at the top you have that celebration of uh, the Lamb and the 144,000 showing as a culmination of everything that indeed victory belongs to Jesus. And not only to Him, because He gives victory to those that are faithful to Him as well. So, We've seen the history from before the cross because the birth of Jesus was in view and uh, through the woman, in a sense, the Old Testament people of God, Israel, was also in view. Then we have gone through the same seven-stage history but presented differently. But the focus is here. In this section, when the beast that was wounded, that only looked like or as if it were wounded, mortally wounded, that is, 
and then it's brought back by the second beast. And I would like to conclude this section, the presentation, pointing out what is actually happening with the beasts. I need you, Michael, please, please come and help me. And then I will need you, Jaime, as well. But not yet, okay? So here we have somebody that we will call now the beast. He's not, but uh, we'll just for the sake of illustration, okay? Things don't go well. So the dragon says, okay, we are going to take him out because the beast, according to the Bible, is wounded by the forces of the dragon himself. So it's practically a maneuver to mess people's mind up. So because there was a counter-reaction to all the persecution, to all the brutality, the force that was used by the beast throughout history, the dragon says, oh, we are going to change strategy. We are going to play as if he is mortally wounded. And for a while, we send him out. And we bring in another beast. <laughs> and uh, he's different. He's smiling. <laughs> he, says, he says, oh, yeah, you suffered. I don't think it was that bad, though. I think we could rethink his story. Maybe it wasn't that bad. Yeah, it was difficult. I admit that, but not that bad. How about rethinking the whole thing and bringing this guy back because he wasn't all that bad in the end. Because his role here is practically to, he to bring him back. Okay, thank you, thank you. Now, I don't know exactly how that is going to happen. I know there are some voices that say that he's already back. I don't believe that. I believe we are still in the other beast period. The point is, at this point in time, we are not yet at this point here where the wound or the wound that seems to be mortal is healed. But according to this prophecy, there will be a time when that wound, that fake wound, because it's just a maneuver, will be healed and the beast that worked here will be brought back. By whom? By this other beast. How exactly will that happen? I don't know. But one word is very strongly emphasized, and that is deceive. And the most striking picture is when he brings fire down from heaven, which is some sort of supernatural um, Holy Spirit-like activity like in the day of Pentecost. Because that's when the Holy Spirit brought fire down and everybody was able to preach in ways that never before happened and everybody was able to understand. So some sort of misleading, deceitful activity will bring in the situation that happened here. It seems that whatever it means, that, that fire being brought from heaven, precedes the moment when the persecuting beast comes back full-fledged from the chronology of the text. And I, I could go back to it. Okay, so verse 13. 
He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Let me repeat the question you asked so the camera can capture it too. So the question was this. Are we saying that this manifestation, whatever that means, fire coming down from heaven, is what brings in or back the persecuting beast, the beast number one, the one coming from uh, the sea. And uh, we have verse 13 here. Verse 13 goes right after the mentioning that he exercising all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the beast, the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. This is the first description. Then it goes into details and says, he performs, that is the second beast, performs signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of man. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image or a copy or a replica to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. See the chronology? So it seems that this supernatural manifestation, whatever that means, precedes the moment where the inhabitants of the earth are convinced to make an image to the previous beast. Um, who was wounded by the sword and lived, and that's when he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. First, the image is created, that's the picture. Then, the second beast breeds over the image of the first beast that was created. It takes life that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Okay? So, yeah, that's how I see it. Chronologically, there must be some sort of a supernatural manifestation, very deceitful, very misleading, very fooling, that brings in a situation that we saw in history before. Persecution. It's very hard to make sense out of all this uh, picture in Revelation chapter 13 without something very strong, very misleading, very deceitful happening. So the question is, is this going to happen when the first beast will gain the power back, the power that was lost when uh, he received the seemingly deadly wound? What I have difficulty with, and I've seen other interpreters um, struggle with the same, is to say whether the first beast will be brought back as it was, plus an image of it that is much bigger than the first beast, or the coming back of the first beast is only manifested in the image, in the replica that is created by the second beast for the first beast. I don't know if that makes sense. So the, the discussion is this. Are we going to have a situation where the same political power that was taken away the power at one point, and it looked like it was wounded in a deadly way, that power will be fully restored as it was, as it used to be. Plus, that kind of power will be extended at a global level. So then you have beast and replica of the beast. Or you only have the replica of the beast, the copy of the beast, which is practically what the beast used to do on a smaller scale, but now this is global. This is 
extended or stretched out over the whole world? And to that, the answer is, I don't know. Good question. So the four angels, you remember there were four angels in chapter 7 that were at the four corners of the earth, and they were told to hold the winds, not let them go yet. Is there any connection between those and what we have here? Well, in this particular passage, I think the only element that we can see is uh, connected to the mark of the beast, because the mark of the beast, in one way or another, is in contrast with the sealing of God. So the people of the enemy get the mark of the beast, whatever that means, and the children of God receive the seal of God, whatever that means. So that's the contrast. After that happens, after the sealing of God's people happens, is completed, then the winds are let loose. So that's when the seven plagues are launched. So that's how I see the connection with this segment. So, again, probation. It's uh, not a word that appears in the book of Revelation. But in the book of Revelation, chapter 16 we have the moment when the service in the sanctuary, uh, 15 and 16, is finished. So that's what is called the probation closed. Okay? So once the probation is closed, according to the chronology of the book of Revelation, and that's what we are going to see next time, that's when the seven plagues start. But... In chapter 7, there is a time called the Great Tribulation. You remember that time, right? So here's the thing. If this is the point where the first beast is brought back, the persecutor, in whatever form, then here, somewhere, there will be a time of Great Tribulation for God's people. Why? because of this guy here. Great Tribulation, which will uh, culminate in the final clash of um, Armageddon. That's the culmination of it. But then there's also a time of Great Tribulation for the enemy when uh, the seven plagues are poured out. So, that's why some people, when they try to establish chronology, will speak about the first Great Tribulation and the second Great Tribulation. Meaning, the first Tribulation is uh, the period of time when God's people will go through difficulties because of the persecution that will be launched by the beast that is brought in by the false prophet. But then, once probation is closed, or grace is no more available, then a uh, time of tribulation starts for uh, the enemies of God, God's people before the second coming. Well, the two wings are two wings. They are, used, they are used for the women to escape. I don't have any biblical imagery where the wing means the Bible, Old or New Testament. I have, however, Bible verses when wings, like the wings of an eagle, represent God's providence, God's intervention, God's... Uh, Escape, protection. protection, if you want, yeah. Rather than, but I'm not saying it cannot be, because somehow, in some ways, you can infer that the Bible is the escape and the protection. But the symbol, I don't think, 
refers to the Bible explicitly. That's a, that's a good observation. So it almost seems like there's no escape. <laughs> right? You're either with the lamb and then the beast will come after you or you're with the beast and uh, you're having it fine for a while but then you have to deal with it. And uh, I have a Bible verse that kind of explains what happens in chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 18. This is what it says. The nations were angry. The nations were angry. And your wrath or anger Anger has come. In other words, God's wrath or God's anger is a response to somebody else's anger. The dragon is angry. The nations are angry. So what God does in the final retribution part, it is an answer to anger. And then it goes on, and this is what it says. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. In other words, final destruction is a response to destruction. So those that destroyed will be destroyed. I know this is not a very popular kind of uh, teaching because uh, people have uh, created God after their image in the postmodern society. And uh, we speak about justice social justice, in all kind of ways. We want justice, but then we want God to finish everything without justice, somehow. See, see what the contrast is? We are asking for justice, and it's very trendy in today's political realm to speak about justice. What is justice? And then when God finally does justice, then we'll cry out and say, oh, how, how can he do this? Well, because he's just. And justice or God's wrath is not some sort of a whimsical, emotional, visceral reaction to something. It is his way, his strange way, the Bible calls it, to be, bring to an end the history of sin, the drama of sin. It cannot be easy. This is a situation like the one that happened today in Texas. The guy enters, the, the, the guy enters and <coughs> shoots around, and then you will think, okay, so should we take him out? Should we let him just do what he wants to do? See what the problem is? So if we have a problem with divine justice or the manifestation of God's indignation or the manifestation of God's wrath, it is like telling God, you know what? Let them shoot one another. Don't worry about them. You can't do that. Not even our normal life can function like that. Situations in our life show, and the one that happened today in Texas proved it again, that there are times when it would be best, humanly speaking, if when the guy enters that room, before he starts shooting, somebody shoots him. That's how we would have done justice. 
So then, is it a problem for God to do a final justice? If that's how we naturally think. See the dilemma? So I believe, yes, it can, it can uh, feel scary that there's no escape. No, there is escape. Because those that are with the Lamb, they are going through the Great Tribulation, but all those that enter the Great Tribulation also come out of the Great Tribulation. And that's the picture in chapter 7. Nobody is lost in the Great Tribulation. That's why the sealing happens prior. The sealing means that once you are sealed, you're safe. Yes, you go through the Tribulation. But that doesn't mean you are lost in the tribulation. So you are safe through the tribulation. And then the next stage is in front of the throne receiving the crown of victory. So that's the picture. Whereas for those that are opposed to the Lamb, they have it uh, good and easy for a while. But then when uh, God does the final justice, they are practically taken out. That's a good, a good observation. So somehow the seven plagues are prefigured in the ten plagues of Egypt. You know the ten plagues of Egypt when the people of God was liberated from Egypt. Because this is a liberating scene as well here. The difference is that it's seven plagues, not ten. But the principle is similar. So it's divine interventions leading up to the moment when they are free at last. And they can leave. Yeah. That's, a, that's an excellent way of putting it. The reason why prophecy is given in advance is for you to know the score of the game. So when you see the game happening and it seems that you are losing, you know you are not losing. Because the score is established already. You know what the score is. And that's the role of biblical prophecy in the end. It's not necessarily, and that's why I try to avoid numbers and chronology, very exact orders, because that's not the point. The point is when you see things happening, you say, oh, okay, yeah, makes sense. Let's see what's next. Okay, makes sense. And you know where you are going. You know who wins. You know who's victorious in the end. This question, am I going to be on the right side of history at that time, is a legit question. Why? Because the most troubling element of, of Revelation 13 is the deceitful course of action through which beast one and beast two and dragon, the whole trio of demonic forces and all their agents will be working on fooling you in all ways possible. And without knowing, without realizing, you can be on the wrong side of history unless and you may, you may think um, I am crazy about this. But when you start believing what the Bible says, you will have all kinds of problems with all kinds of people. Test for me and you will see. But if you don't start believing what the Bible says, you will end up fooled, deceived. That's what the Bible says. That's the whole meaning of uh, end time prophecy. Not that we start speculating, not that we start uh, doing the craziness of, oh, have you heard oh, this and that happened? Yeah, it's good to keep an eye on events. And I do that. And you should do that too. And I have responsibility for you with regard to those events. But I don't think it's our responsibility to constantly being speculating 
and always seeing somebody doing something that is prophetically significant, because not everything happening in this world is prophetically significant. There are things that are prophetically significant and things that are just normal or abnormal course of life. But the question is, do we, do we want to know what is going to happen? Do we want to have that relationship with Jesus Christ? Follow the Lamb wherever He goes? Which is a very, very strong and close relationship. And you will see society is heading in a direction where if you believe this, I mean, if you believe in the Jesus Christ of this, because there will be all kind of Jesus Christ, the beast himself masquerades Jesus Christ. So this, this thing, Jesus, it's, it's very popular. All the big preachers preach Jesus. But there's all kind of Jesus that they preach. And there's one more to it. There are Bible passages in the Gospels. Jesus says that they will beat you in the synagogues. The synagogue is not the police department. If you understand what I'm saying. So when we have the impression it's going to be only a beastly persecution. No, it's a false impression. It is a woman riding a beast. The woman that became a harlot in the desert, and instead of being the faithful bride of the lamb, became the lover of the beast. So what we are looking at is not only a political persecution, it's a religious political persecution. And let me ask you, if a woman rides a beast, who leads, the woman or the beast? So then what kind of persecution would it be? It's gonna be a religious persecution. But again, why are we given this? So we know the result of the game. Not to be scared. And to understand the importance of clinging to the Jesus Christ of the Bible. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your revelation. It's so good to know that victory belongs to Jesus so good to know that only in him we have safety and security and in him there is no way for the enemy to be able to destroy us may that knowledge that awareness stay in our hearts in jesus name through the holy spirit amen